Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. Certainly from where NEF is, the New York Economics Foundation is concerned, the idea of efficiency and tackling what it means and how we can redefine it is really important because among much else, we're trying to work out how you build a, a welfare system that is fit for the 21st century. And one of the main barriers, in a sense, is the idea that you can only measure efficiency by cost. Some years ago, I went to a conference somewhere north of here, about a couple of hundred miles or so, um, which is actually about the future of extended schools. And the first speaker was an amazing head teacher, Debbie Morrison, then the head of Mitchell High School in Stoke-on-Trent. And Debbie told the dramatic story of how the school had been turned around, but also about her first day in the post. There had been a commotion outside her office, and her secretary warned her not to go outside, because the angry parent who'd recently um, hit another member of staff over the head with a pair of muddy shorts was outside again. Three years on, um, the angry parent was the head of their antisocial behaviour unit. Her friends had also taken up responsible roles around the school and they were paid, interesting this one, in chocolate coins. It struck me that this was um, not just a prime example of co-production in action, it was also the logical extension of localism. Because you can't have government guidelines about how to pay people in chocolate coins. It depends entirely on the relationships involved. So Debbie Morrison is one of those people who has a genius at making relationships with people and making things happen. You can't boil that down into a set of deliverables. After she sat down at the conference, the next speaker was the civil servant charged with rolling out extended schools across one of the regions. And it was clear within a minute or so um, that he would fail because he thought in terms of KPIs, targets, guidelines and systems, but he missed the one crucial ingredient that had made the difference between success and failure which is what I would call the human element. And he was also revealing, it seems to me, the besetting sin of officials, which is boiling down successful examples to universal principles which they believe can be applied anywhere. First, they take on an intractable problem about neighbourhoods, communities and places. Then they remove the apparently dull but essential <coughs> human details. Second, they formulate some abstract maxims that can apply to any situation anywhere. Third, they appoint somebody who can be trusted to put those maxims into effect without taking any notice of local peculiarities. Fourth, they assign a narrow measure to every aspect of the task and convince themselves that you can somehow capture and pin down the progress by measuring it. And um, the trouble is, you can't actually separate the general from the specific, as the little things actually matter the most. The looks exchanged between neighbours, the small repairs, the minor pieces of vandalism, that's what makes the difference between successful failure. But the thing about successful people is they make things happen in their own way. They use their human skills and intuition, not the boiled down maxims preferred by those who employ them. Human beings have a critical role to play in public services and not just in public services. Well, the trouble is, let's face it, we're living through an era when the human factor is regarded as a pernicious source of error. So we replace them with IT systems wherever we can and preferably IT systems that provide information to the bosses before they help the customers. What we've forgotten, it seems to me, is that especially in public services, human beings are also the only real source of success, the only source of genuine change. Things that succeed have a personality behind them, and we know that from personal experience, but we fly from the implications. 21% of Year 8 pupils say they've never spoken to a teacher, although that statistic has miraculously disappeared from the Department of Education's website. <laughs> Um, so you have to believe me, scary that one. According to a survey of University of Chicago Hospital, three quarters of patients can't name the doctor who's treated them, and of the rest, 40% get the name wrong. So <clears throat> if efficiency depends on relationships, these things matter, and they cost vast sums of money. It also means that we should be recruiting people for their personality, not necessarily their qualifications. So we certainly have to educate people differently. We have to find some ways to rescue those vital public institutions which have employed the wrong people for generations, where they've systematically removed their staff's ability to make things happen. It also seems to me, and this is a bit more controversial, we have to reduce the scale of our public institutions. Factory schools and hospitals are good for the salaries of their senior staff, 
but big institutions have to rely that much more on systems and relationships, and they will always be less effective for that very reason. So we know from research that small police forces catch more criminals than big police forces. We know that patients recover quickly when they know their doctor. We know that small schools have more choice, more after-school activities, more tolerance, and better results than big schools. Of course they do, because there are genuine relationships there, not systems. So first a bit about Nesta. We're a public endowment, and we're here to promote innovation. We do that in three main ways, through research, through practical experimentation, and through investment. We have our own venture capital team. And we're interested both in the conditions under which innovation flourishes and the innovation process itself. Now, the bit of Nesta that I'm in is called the Public Services Lab, and we're explicitly interested in innovation for the social and public good. And we believe firmly that there are better ways of designing our public services so that we can both better actually deliver better outcomes and also uh, do them for cheaper, do them for less money. Now, co-production really is about a deep and a sustained collaboration between professionals and users, both in terms of the design and in terms of the delivery of services. And crucially, it's an asset-based approach, which means it looks to what people can bring to their lives, not just what their needs are. So basically, Nesta, like many other organisations, has become interested in co-production through examples like the Local Area Coordination Programme in Australia, and I'll just tell you a little bit about that. So that's been working with disabled people, it puts them at the centre, and it starts the whole process from a completely different starting point. So instead of asking people, what are your needs, you ask people, what kind of life do you want to live? And the answers you get are very different. No one really actually wants to be dependent on services when it comes down to it. They want friends, they want a job, they want to live independently. And so what happens is, through this programme, people get connected to existing social networks through libraries, time banks, choirs, whatever it may be. And through that connectedness and that support that people get, you actually see massive and incredibly impressive shifts away from things like residential care and drop-in centres. And evaluations demonstrated uh, reductions in costs of 30%, which is really quite remarkable. The second example is social challenge prizes. And I think Nesta would argue that that's an, another way of thinking about efficiency. So basically what happens is you set out a very clear outcome that you want to achieve. You then make an open call for ideas, get ideas for, from as many different places as possible. Then you actively support those ideas through a development process, stage gating it very carefully so that basically only the most promising ideas go forward. And basically at the end, those that have proven that they've worked get the cash prize. And that's the key thing here. You only give the prize to the people that have actually demonstrated their solution works. Now, why, why social challenge prizes? What's the link to efficiency? Well, a couple of things. Firstly, we didn't fund any solutions that didn't work. So that's good. The other thing was we didn't spend lots of time and process and bureaucracy over specifying how that outcome should be achieved. We just set the outcome, which was to reduce carbon emissions, and then we just let the, we supported, so all of the resources that then went into it was about building capacity and delivering the outcomes. It wasn't about us coming up with the solutions or us monitoring how people are doing it or any of that. So to that extent, I think it's quite an interesting uh, approach to efficiency. And the last example I'm going to talk you through is something that we call radical efficiency. And it's basically a program that we've been running that looks at how to design different and better public services at lower cost. And we do this through increasing the efficiency of service <coughs> delivery models, which basically inc involves building on family and community assets to reach more families in greater need using fewer resources. And also through improving the effectiveness of services. And we do this through engaging with service users deeply to actually really understand what their needs are so that you're not designing a service basically on a misapprehension of what people actually want or what they need. And we use techniques like ethnography to gather insights through that. We've applied that approach to early years. And over the past 18 months, we've been working intensively with teams of early years service providers to redesign their early years provision. And basically, they're, they're quite a diverse bunch of projects, but what they all had in common was that their existing services didn't actually reach the people that they were meant to reach. So the most isolated, the most segregated, they just weren't getting the service. And also, the services were, as we're all familiar with, they were uncoordinated, they were inflexible, they were bureaucratic, and they were expensive. So not only were they not doing what they were supposed to do, they were expensive at the same time. Families felt little control over their lives, and there was also an insufficient focus on early intervention. So all in all, lots of problems to solve. 
And what the uh, programme has done has been to redesign these public services around basically promoting better outcomes for both parents in terms of their job prospects, debt, mental health, family breakdown, and also in terms of the children's outcomes in terms of getting their better education attainment, reducing the child poverty standards, um, and getting better health and well-being for the kids. And what these examples take you to is a way of providing public services that is much more relationship-based. It involves both service users and professionals, taking judgments, taking control over the situation, taking a more holistic approach to the, to the issue. They're also more local in terms of how the, what, how the solutions are being developed. And they also build community capacity and they tap into the hidden wealth within our communities. Things like local knowledge, local assets and local infrastructure. These approaches can only thrive where relationships can thrive. And we all know that for relationships to thrive, you need things like trust. Um, so to get these kind of collaborative local solutions, you also need to change the mindset within which people go to the solution itself. You can't basically go in with an exclusive focus on cost reduction, although we're reasonably confident that these, these examples can get you to cost reductions, but you can't enter it with that mindset. Right now, there are many local authorities who deliver housing repairs to the tenants on the day and at the time the tenants want it. And they also deliver this service at half the original cost. There are many local authorities who now deliver housing benefits in a matter of a few days, uh, saving about 40% of their operating costs. And they don't just solve the housing benefits problem, they also solve contextual problems for people. Uh, and the first uh, piece of work uh, of this nature in health uh, is in Plymouth, where they uh, have improved the quality of stroke care and halved the costs. Uh, I could go on, there are many other examples. This is evidence. These things have been delivered and are being sustained. Now, the difficult news is that the leaders of these organisations have got there through learning about what's wrong with conventional management and instead designing services to manage value rather than manage cost. The bad news is it goes right against the grain of policy. Clearly, we have to square the circle with the fact that there clearly is some evidence that there are some improvements from shared services, uh, but we have to square the circle against the fact that there are massive train wrecks. Uh, think of the Department of Transport, the Home Office, uh, the UK Research Councils, and so on, and there's plenty of others around the world, interestingly. Um, I want to talk about the reasons for failure of, of shared services. The first reason for failure is that they're, they're IT-led. That's been mentioned already. The second reason for failure in shared services is, is industrial design. Um, you know, we're obsessed at the moment with the idea that we need front offices and back offices, and we need to have workflow systems, hence IT will dominate the way it works. Uh, this is to focus on cost. <coughs> One of the things you learn is that when you focus on cost, you drive your costs up. <laughs> there are two basic arguments in the literature for economy of scale and the benefits you get from scale. The first is that you save some money by having less of a common resource. So we'll have fewer managers, fewer buildings, uh, fewer IT systems, you know, those kinds of things. Now, that's palpably true, often quite difficult to achieve, but it's the reason why w these things appear to be working, because particularly in, the, in their early days, you might shed a building or shed a manager. The second argument for economies of scale is lower transaction costs. Now, this is true and untrue. It's true in the sense that you do get lower transaction costs. It's untrue in the sense that when you pursue lower transaction costs, you actually drive the total cost of service right up. In 2005, we had a target that every local authority should have a call center. That's because people think it's going to be cheaper over the phone than seeing people face to face. What actually happened is the big consultancies will go into local authorities and say, why don't we count up all the telephone calls and move them to a call centre? And as soon as you take telephone work away from the service work, you disable the service and you create failure demand, as I call it, back into the front end of the system. And this happens everywhere. It's a common phenomenon. We standardise these back offices, we specialise the work, we stitch it all together with IT, and it fails miserably. Having said that, I have to say to you, I'm not against sharing services. So if we go back to housing benefits, for example, uh, the people that have studied... Uh, well, first of all, I should say that housing benefits had a mandatory a design bullied into them by the Department of Work and Pensions, where you've got to have a front office and a back office and an IT system and all those things. First, one of the first industrial designs in local authorities. Uh, people who studied it 
uh, because that's how you make this change, uh, learn that it's creating its own demand, and therefore they get rid of the front office, back office design. Having understood demand, they put the right people with the right expertise in front of people to solve the benefits issue immediately and deal with their contextual issues, and that's how they get this massive improvement in service and, and drive out the costs. You see, the, the lesson here is very simple. When you manage value, you drive costs out of the system. You could then go on to, or could we get a bit less of a saving, but another saving from less of a common resource? The Stockport Metropolitan Council had an IT help desk. They studied it and discovered it didn't help. Um, and now, now, it, now they've redesigned it. Again, same basic principle. Let's understand demand. Let's build the expertise into the front of the system to absorb the variety of demand. They now have a, an IT help desk that helps, and it operates at 17% less cost. You know, who put these numbers in a plan? Um, now you could share, because you'll just deal with the minor saving from less of a common resource. So how to share? Study it where it is, improve it where it is, big improvements from improving flow. Then, second, then finally, can we get some minor improvements from less of a common resource? And we might. All of these things are achieved without a plan, no business case required, all you've got to do is go and study and on the basis of what you learn, get knowledge and then redesign and you learn to manage value. Economy comes from flow, it doesn't come from scale. The further we pursue scale ideas, the more we're going to have distant services that are alienating. That means understanding demand, it means managing value. This is local, it's collaborative and it builds stronger communities. If we rely on people and relationships and we chuck out bureaucracy, how can we make sure that everyone gets treated well and that we have, as to use NEF terminology, well-being for all, not just for those who happen to be the lucky ones? We have developed a lot of these systems, and especially recruitment systems, for instance, in order to make them transparent, in order to iron out those uh, you know, dark corners where things went wrong and with, were racist and, and a whole range of other things. The difficulty is that we've, we have now the worst of both worlds. So we have the systems and transparency, but it doesn't work. So, you know, you might, as well, you might as well go back to the old system. Perhaps not. I mean, I don't want to go back to the old system. But somehow we have to find a way to make it transparent, but to allow the individuals to make the relationships in the way that they, they did do before. And I don't think that's impossible, but it does require us um, to think differently, I think, about, about education so that we're not just relying on a few brilliant individuals who can make relationships and make things happen. We're actually making sure these skills, are, they, are, they are in all of us. They are human skills, but we don't usually bring them to work, and uh, I think we need to find some ways of maximising them. What would happen in the sort of uh, context of radical efficiency if you had much better outcomes, but for no less cost? What, what's more important? cost or the outcomes? Ness is very aware of the context in which we're working, which is why we think there are, there are lots of reasons for aiming for reduced costs in any case. Um, I think you'd have to ask the commissioner in terms of whether they would buy a service for the same amount of money that gets better outcomes or even for more money that gets better outcomes. One would hope there would be circumstances in a world in which that would happen. Um, I've got a feeling the reality is that that doesn't happen. Just sorry, but in the efficiency, does cost trump outcomes or the other way around? Can I answer? It's a very interesting thing. You know, one of the things that I was talking about that, uh, that is important that we've learned is that there's a paradox that when you manage value, you drive costs out of the system. So managing value means focusing on the outcomes. And we got a great example is drug treatment. What we've done is we've, we've, we've commissioned drug treatment services and so we've standardised them, we've packaged them up, and we said, we're going to buy them from you, and we, you're going to do this. Well, the problem is this doesn't actually meet the variety of needs of the people who are hooked on drugs. Now, if we turn it around and we take the proposition we're interested in an outcome, then we'll do what's right for each of these individuals. And the paradox is it will be cheaper as well as achieving the goal. By commissioning services, as we have done on a national scale, we don't solve the problem, we create more cost for ourselves as well as social problems. How do you think we can turn this around and is it really worth it because there's always another kind of evidence that the politicians who don't agree with your evidence will be able to find? The first thing we've got to do 
is get rid of <coughs> the thousands of children in Whitehall whose job it is to come up with ideas. <laughs> I think the th second thing we've got to do is to recognise that innovation can only occur when we make those who are responsible for delivering the services responsible. So, you know, we've had 15 odd years of we'll innovate in Whitehall and tell you what to do, and then we'll send the Audit Commission out to make sure that you've complied, and we'll treat that as evidence that our policy is working. We've got to turn that around. We've actually got to say, no, no, we, and this is not a soft option. It's saying to you, if you run a local service, we're going to hold you to account, but, you know, it's up to you. You've got to innovate, and how are you doing that? We want, we want you to show your community, we want you to show other people who would turn up for whatever purposes, but let's be clear, it has to be with you. 